everybody, and welcome to the 101st Shut Up and Sit Down podcast live from PAX Unplugged in Philadelphia. Give yourself a round of applause, everybody! We are back in the city of brotherly love, and oh brother, have we got some lovely games <laughs> for you. Uh, first up today, we're going to talk about a little old game that came out just 20 years ago. Uh, <laughs> this is a photograph on the screen. You can see now, for those of you listening at home, it's me wearing a delightful turtleneck sweater, losing my mind in the corner of a hotel on the edge of Philadelphia. People often think that we don't like really complicated Euro games. They're like, oh, shut up and sit down like simple games. Every time we fly halfway around the world, we always crack out some of the most complicated things we can play to play whilst jet lagged. So why? I don't know why. What? It's just the only time we have like eight hours. What should we do? Let's play uh, uh, Hellscape. <laughs> so what we've got here, this is Roads and Boats from fantastic uh, Netherlands publisher Splotter, who you may well know for Food Chain Magnate. One, it was Mr. Splotter's in the audience. <laughs> uh, no, so Roads and Boats was one of the first Splotter games. Uh, we were lucky enough to play Bus as well this trip, which we'll be talking about later. Um, I'm stalling because how on earth do you describe Roads and Boats? I mean, I think the key thing to look at here is about the fact that it's, it's minor detail on the image, but I'm basically staring as if I'm losing my mind. And really all I'm looking at is a board of hexagon pieces uh, with maybe two or three donkeys on it. <laughs> uh, and really that kind of sums up Roads and Boats. It's a game of building infrastructure. So we kept having very nice elderly uh, people staying at the hotels coming up and saying, oh, are you guys playing something? Is this like Settlers of Catan? And we're like, yeah, yeah. but in hell. <laughs> um, because it's, it's not enough that you're like, yeah, I've made some wood, fantastic. But unfortunately, the wood isn't very well connected to the hub of my road system, which means I'm dying. Uh, <laughs> it's not enough to just build resources in this game or have resources come to you. You also have to build the infrastructure that's going to allow you to move them around with limited transportation, limited resources, and limited brain cells. Uh, yeah, that's a very elegant way of describing what is, in some ways, an elegant game. Yeah. Um, in Roads and Boats, you start, imagine you are parachuted into a sort of um, an empty landscape, and you have got, we know this because we've played it twice in two days, unbelievably, you get five uh, planks of wood, yep. one pile of bricks, mm -hmm. Three, two don three donkeys? Three donkeys three, and two geese. Three donkeys and two geese. Because you need two geese. Ah, uh, yes. To, to geese, Don't laugh at the geese, they're very important. tango. Uh, and, you, need, uh, you need geese to research. Yes, you do. It's, it's one of the lovely things about Splatter is they don't really take their game seriously at all. And it means that, you, first of all, you have to use your geese. The way you research things is you leave two geese in a space with a piece of paper. Oh, and one of your... Okay, yeah. you, two geese and a piece of paper and one of your units, so a donkey. A donkey. Uh, that will then consume the geese in the paper and produce research, which will allow you to do things such as create oil rigs. <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of knows that it's not 100% sensible, but there's loads of rules which are just wonderful that you don't make any sense, but you can't forget them. Like the fact that if you want to breed donkeys, which of course are the only transportation you can breed, um, not in the real world. Let's not get into that. Um, and geese by leaving them alone. <laughs> yes. in, a, in a pasture. So it has to be one of the nice light green areas and there have to be no buildings there and there can't be any, any other donkeys or carriages or people there. Wait, Matt, what if I've got two donkeys on one side of a river and on the other side of the river is a log? No, that log is really going to put them off. <laughs> Um, and basically you cannot have anything there. It has to just be like this idea that these two geese are looking at each other and they'll be like, hmm, this, we could think about maybe, and then someone just goes, actually, I've just seen a pile of bricks <laughs> uh, over there. I'm really not. So it's, yeah, it, it's just, it's absolutely bizarre, but wonderfully entrancing. Well, Has, I, it's pretty interesting having played Food Chain Magnet and going back to this, because all of the rules in this are absurd and yet, incredibly clever. Like, because, to, to talk more about sort of grand strategy in a bit, and to clarify, we're talking about this a lot because uh, it's been re-released recently and it's amazing. It is, it's phenomenal. Uh, most, we, how many games have we all played about, you know, get resources, use resources for other resources? Roads and Boats is maybe the first game we've played where it's like, but where are the resources? And it's a game of logistics. You'll notice there's actually a sheet of plastic acetate laid over the board on which you draw roads because donkeys can only move one hex or two uh, along a road, but hellishly, once you upgrade the donkeys to, like, trucks or carts, they can only go on roads. Yeah, it means the donkey is the only off-road vehicle available to mankind. 
uh, which is is really a problem when you find you've upgraded all of your donkeys to basically 18-wheeler lorries uh, and then realise that you, you just can't get to anything. Okay, and listen, You, you want to cry and you just, you cry. Now, what you're looking at uh, on the slideshow at the minute is Matt and I first game of Frozen Boats. That was fun and it looks like a sort of pile of resources. Looks mm, a bit like Catan. Lovely. If we advance to our second game of Frozen Boats, you will see what I like to call the DMZ. Yeah. Yeah. So, now it's not enough, of course, because if you've played Splatter games before, they are outrageously innovative. So, Rosen Boats isn't just a game about logistics. It's also a game where nothing belongs to anyone. Okay, now this is, this is gonna, this takes a, a sort of a mental leap if you've grown up in a capitalist society, but technically, the concept of ownership isn't real. <laughs> okay, if Matt has a pile of bricks and I take, quote unquote, his bricks, you know, outside of law courts, that's not... It, legality is a concept. Oh, mate, let's, this is now a philosophy podcast. Yeah, but unfortunately, <laughs> rather than this being a lovely kind of like Settlers of Catan, but with socialism, it's just kind of like this proto-capitalist hellscape. It's like before <laughs> they've devised any rules to actually like work out any of these systems, there's just no police. Yeah. So it'll be like, well, of course, you don't own these trees. And it's like, yeah, no, of course, no one owns trees. You know, it's like, well, of course, you don't own these logs. And it's like, well... I did build the, the, the building that turns the, the trees into logs, but sure, I guess they're still trees. And then it's like, well, you don't really own this manufactured petroleum. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it becomes this thing of you built this entire infrastructure and you're turning gold into coins and then someone just turns up and is like, well, actually, I'm just going to take all of your coins. And there's literally nothing you can do about <laughs> it. Uh, we, it's time to talk about the best thing in our Rosen Boats game. It's time to talk about the Jason Bourne of donkeys. Okay, so you will notice if you look at the picture, uh, there are walls you can build in roads and boats. You can turn bricks into walls. Mm -hmm. And actually, and this for any sort of um, more hardcore strategy gamers in the audience, you will realize the horrible ramifications of this immediately. So transporters can drive over and pick up anything, right? Unless they're on an uh, opposing transporter. The walls you put on the map aren't technically walls because your opponents can't move through them. But you can. Mm -hmm. Which means if you go, oh, this is my territory and throw up a wall between you and an opponent. Um, it's not a wall, because you can still drive over into their territory. It's a gate. So you kind of think, oh, like the, when you first put down a massive green wall, I was, in some ways I was relieved because I thought, well, that's good. At least I don't have to worry. We, you know, we've separated ourselves, but we haven't at all. <laughs> it just means that you can come into my house whenever you like, but there's absolutely no way I can get into your house. And you can knock them down. And I, as you can see in here, I have knocked one of them down. There's a, there's a, a tan, plain, vanilla wood-flavoured wall in the middle. Oh, which, this is the worst rule. Yeah, basically it means whenever you knock down walls, then it then costs as if you were upgrading a wall to make it too high, or however high it was. I when think, you knock it down, you'd have to keep paying more and more. So the simple way to put it, if, if I build a wall and Matt tears it down, it's not that that wall's removed from the board. It's just now a neutral wall that anyone can go through, so you can't build on that space as easily, which means if those walls get torn down, now... That's just like Mad Max. Like anyone can get into those spaces. Anyway, so what happened is I was building some walls. Matt noticed this. He slipped a donkey into my territory. I thought, you know what? In a game where you only have five transporters to move everything around, I thought, I'm going to wall this donkey in. <laughs> and what happened next was basically a war crime for both of us. Because... I mean, I was having a lovely time. Well... But you were really not. So you so, were getting really quite stressed. I, no, 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 you can you can be honest. I threw a hissy fit and started getting very grumpy. Well, I mean, it was interesting in the fact that there was there were level there were a number of steps that led to the donkey incident. Uh, f first of all, there was the fact that we had this quite extreme expansionism and building all of these mines in the mountains that were technically, as we've already discussed, didn't really belong to anybody. But they were mine. But they were his. Also, the fact that he'd had this bizarre strategy earlier where he's built about a metric ton of bricks and was like, oh, we had too many bricks. And you were just, you were piling them up everywhere. It was ostentatious. It was like I've gone to your house and you're like, oh, these things? This is just my second brick room. Well, Spoken we were, like a man who only produced one brick a I was, turn. I was producing one brick a turn, which meant every turn. It was like, it was basically the granite equivalent of of starving, of being like, <laughs> I can either build one wall or one road or one building. And it was hell. So I just thought, look, if I can just have one donkey pop over there and just bring back a couple of bricks. Kind of as if, it, it, it was as if you popped over to your neighbor's house to borrow a cup of sugar. Exactly. Except your neighbor wasn't home. <laughs> exactly. And that's how it used to be back in the day where we didn't have to <laughs> lock our doors and we just 
donkeys <laughs> would walk in on each other's houses and take bricks. Look, the thing was, I didn't want any trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think most I, burglars don't. I, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a reasonably good response. I just wanted two bricks. Yeah. And admittedly- No, hang on, you came to- th You have completely misremembered this. You were coming to well, the mine for my gold. Well, I mean, listen, all I wanted was bricks. <laughs> but, I figured that as I had to go through your mine on the way, <laughs> I might as well temporarily just hold on to a couple of bits of gold. Because maybe you weren't going to be happy about me taking some bricks. So that was kind of leverage. Right. I was like, how about I give you this gold for these bricks? It's, a, it's called trading. <laughs> um, and I, I just wanted to leave. The thing was, like, I, I just, I wanted to get my donkey out. And I was like, look, I just, I don't, because all I could do after we built the wall, it was like, has anyone ever here, has anyone ever here played StarCraft? I'm sure some people have or familiar with it. Well, there's a tactic you can do when you're playing StarCraft where you can send one of your little workers to their side of the map and to look at where they are and what they're doing, but then you can also just make them kind of go around doing annoying things. Building a bunker yeah, in and, the wrong place. Yeah, and then place. people are just like, oh, and you can basically distract someone from being able to play their game by having them chase around this annoying worker. I was doing that. I was SCV trolling with a donkey, <laughs> where the donkey was just sort of walking around, picking up resources, moving around, dropping them other places. And then at one point I realized, I was like, I can just pick up his bricks and build walls within his territory, <laughs> randomly, with his bricks, which you can see I've done. He never destroyed them. He just built more roads because he couldn't be bothered. And he was losing his mind, but the whole time I was just like, I just wanted the donkey to come home. I, I just wanted, like, that he wouldn't let him. So and it, Matt and I then had a, a conversation of a tenor, which I would imagine you'd have a few negotiating with Somali pirates, where, <laughs> where, where I was saying to Matt, look, okay, listen, what do you want? You know, that donkey can leave, because donkeys can carry two things, right? And, yeah. And I, Matt was saying, like, I, I can leave with two gold, and I'm like, no, no, you will leave with one gold, and I will, you can leave the, by that one gap in the wall that yeah. I left open. We it, found out in the end there was a rule that could have allowed me to get the donkey out without any negotiation. Well, no, only because you turned it into a wagon at my factory, which basically, <laughs> no, 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 the rule didn't let you get the donkey back. The rule no, was, I, I could have converted it into a lorry No, elsewhere. you didn't convert it, you dissolve the donkey yeah, in right, my territory. Yeah, let's not, let's not, you know, let's not be... <laughs> It's not it's getting to me dissolving donkeys. to be left behind after Well, the... yeah, so I, I, that was the other thing, is I realized I could upgrade it into a wagon on his side of the thing, and he just started freaking out. It was just like, this, is, this has to end. Um, so in the end, we, we did come to an agreement where I could see he was really quite stressed, and I said, look, I'm just going to take one bit of gold and a couple of bricks, and I'm going to just leave. And we opened up the wall, and I left. But it was great, because the donkey was there for such a long time that we did definitely go through a period where I just started to pretend that I had no knowledge of the donkey. And, it, uh, and I kept being like, I'm really sorry, it's a rogue agent. Like, we don't have any idea what he's doing. Like, we haven't heard from him. And then it was like, towards the end of the game, it was like, yeah, we've declassified the files and we can, you know, <laughs> we can admit that the donkey was a KGB spy. Um, uh, so yeah, it's easy to, uh, to joke about roads and boats and what happened in our game, but honestly, in terms of a logistical economic puzzle, it's absolutely fascinating. Like, I think Matt and I were, were really blown away. Um, yeah. And we, Roads and Boats, now the version you can buy, if you can find it, because it's Splotter, so they don't make a lot of games, but uh, it comes with Roads and Boats and etc., which kind of like the new food chain magnet expansion, the catch-up mechanism, adds a bunch of modules you can add in. And uh, I wanted to highlight one of them, uh, or a couple actually, just to show just how absurd this game is. One of the modules is Managers, so you're like, you know, weird brick factories and donkeys can be managed by a token, which is a man in a suit. Uh, you train them at a special building called a BB, BBS, or Business Bullshit School. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, one of the modules it adds is art. You can create, you can turn a donkey into a roving art caravan and fill it with pottery and sculptures. And this is also, God, this is splutter all over, but I'm getting really excited. Because the way you score with art is if art's in your territory, it doesn't mean anything, but you have to load up this donkey with art, which you make from sculptures and pearls and all this stuff, and then send that donkey to your opponent's home space so it can put on an art show. <laughs> which which is difficult with a DMZ. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, absolutely superb, fascinating game. And uh, I think, honestly, I would love to see more designers play it and get ideas about logistics from Roads and Boats. Oh, it's bizarrely good. There's, there's one rule in it which I just think is, I, it, it blows my mind it's not in more things. In just the fact that all of the play is simultaneous all the time. You just each do everything up until the point where you go, ah, hang on, 
Like, I'm actually going to do something now which is going to interfere with you. And then you can say, well, I don't want you to do that. I want to go first this turn. But then it means like basically there's like a kind of a, a second track. There's the turn order track. And then there's almost like the that's not fair track. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it means that like if you say, I want to go first this turn to stop you from like stealing all of my gold with your donkey, for example. Um, then you can, but then you go to the back of the track. So next time you want to be like, but that's not fair. I want to go first. It's like, well, you can't until the other players have said that again. So yeah. it, means it, gives, it means everyone has an equal opportunity throughout the game to go, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you can't take that because I want to take that. Which in so many games, like I think about playing Altiplano, which is like technically a game where you have to play in turns because there'll be a one point in an hour and a half where you yep. cross over. It's just such an elegant little system. No, and I think, why don't games do that more often? Absolutely so. fantastic, yeah. Uh, God, did we mention that the end, get, like, you know, you even get points for gold. You get more points turning the gold into coins or the most points for turning the coins into stocks. Mm. And so traditionally, the way you uh, win the game is by building this wonder, but it means a game of roads and boats can end with your two competing weird business empires. One of you going, I built a wonder to, you know, this weird non-specified non deity. And someone else is like, yeah, I own $8 billion in stocks. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you mentioned Mad Max earlier, and the more I think about it, the more I think, yeah, it is Mad Max, because you, you can't, there's no buildings to store any of the money or stuff you make. You score at the end yeah. based on what is currently on your vehicles. And it's funny, in this second game, which ended up with this horrendous land war, um, I think it didn't help that it was a super symmetrical map, so it did feel like, like Starcraft, Starcraft yeah. in quite a big way, just waiting for one of us to mess up on the optimization. But when I did let my donkey now wagon come back from its adventure on your half of the board, I did realize that having opened up that wall, I could in fact just send an entire fleet of vans <laughs> through to basically just walk around and pick up all of your stuff because you couldn't hold it. Yeah, completely strip mine me. Yeah. And the only reason I didn't do it is because I knew it would absolutely destroy Quince <laughs> and he would be true. so sad. It's completely so, true. As with all Splatter games, it might be like, this sounds fun, but you've got to bear in mind, it's very much like game design with all of the safety and bumpers taken off, and it's it's pretty mean. Yeah, roads and boats, it's the destruction derby of economic games. Should we move on? Yeah. Rock and roll. Uh, oh, yeah, you wanted to talk about this briefly. Yeah, I'm just going to talk about this really briefly. This is a game called Vidoran Gardens, and it's a very small box, and it's got these lovely little square cards that have nine different sections on it, and they're all things like deserts or grassland or water or earth, and you have to place them along overlapping in different sections, but you're never allowed to keep overlapping in the same ways. And you have to try and make contiguous areas of one thing with lots of different types of things within it. I'm just gonna say basically, like I played it about a month ago and I just want to give people a heads up that it looks like a really light, fun game to play as a warm up to an evening of games. And it's not. It's hellishly, hellishly brain melty and it absolutely destroyed me. So if you like that kind of thing, great, but I just thought it needed a bit of a public announcement on it because of the fact that on the front of the box is this guy. <laughs> and I completely fell for his big, beautiful blue eyes and little cute nose and the little bumblebee on the flowers. And I thought, you know what, this will be a nice way to start a game night before we go in something heavy. And I just destroyed four fully grown men. Um, <laughs> So just, just be aware of that. That's all I've got to say on that. Is we're doing the Mega Games cast today. We didn't really talk about this. We've got loads of board games to talk about. Oh, yeah. Uh, we yeah. forgot to mention the premise of what we're doing today. Hello. <laughs> I'm going to burp. That was probably That's timed. not part of it. <clears throat> um, we basically, we haven't done a podcast for a while, as some people might know. So we were just going to go through loads of games we played. Yeah, we are. Uh, coming up next is Slide Quest, a game that some people uh, might have uh, heard of because it has a fantastic concept. Uh, this is a uh, up to four player, best with four, dexterity game where the box uh, is the game like you're four years old. Um, because what you do is you've got this plastic uh, board suspended within the board by four levers that stick out of the edges of the board. Now you're going to put a map sheet in the middle uh, and you've got this knight, this little blue knight with a ball bearing under his bum and he slides around. So, you know, each player will, it's a co-op game, each player sits at one of the yellow levers. Each and, player sits on a ball bearing. He's, no, that's whatever you do in your own time, Matthew. Uh, so, uh, you, players can only control the game by pressing down on the lever, which tilts the board ever so slightly. It's actually a pretty impressive work of engineering. But that means if you want to move diagonally, then two people have to both press down at exactly the same time. At 
exactly the same strength as well. Now, uh, I've heard a lot of people talk about slide quests and say, oh yeah, it's a good bit of fun. It's a family game. It's got the campaign of 20 missions, which kind of link together to tell a sort of Zelda style story. There's lots of holes in the board and you lose if the knight falls into a hole. Uh, you can push a little wooden goblin into a hole and then that means you've killed it and it will never go home to its family. But what's important is that I've heard people talk about it and go, oh yeah, it's fun. It's cute. It's a cute little concept. No. Right, here's the thing, because me and my friends played this, we had some beers, and uh, the game comes with an app. And as we all now know, I hope, if a game comes with an app, you download the app because it will have the crappiest music ever yeah. that will significantly improve the experience. So we get the slide quest app, and we set it running, and it has a timer, okay? So it not only tracks your campaign progress with your lives and stuff, but it uh, sets now, slide quest has a timer. And that timer turns Slide Quest into the most hardcore dexterity game I've ever played. Four people, you know, me and three of my friends were sat around this game with our little levers, like almost, like if it had been any hotter in the room, sweat would have been dripping off our noses. Like yeah. rather than having three minutes to guide the night around the map, you have like 30 seconds. So you are screaming the entire time. <laughs> Go, 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 go! No, move the dynamite, move the dynamite! No, 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 no. And then you're in a hole because you, obviously it's got the ball bearing has momentum, so you need to move it quickly. But if you move it slightly too quickly, it just rockets along the board. It is absolutely phenomenal. I'm just imagining the fact that you've got these two different axes of things to be lift. It's like rowing a boat through time. Oh yeah, no, it's incredibly difficult. But one of the things that makes it really hard is. Um, Monsters have to be pushed into specific holes, if you look at the picture we've got on the screen. But also, very quickly, it adds things like dynamite, which is a small red thing which you might have to push into a hole, but it's an incredibly slim little uh, wooden oh, piece. Oh, yeah, I can see that might be a problem. Oh, no, it's uh, it's absolutely phenomenal. But again, like you with the Doran Gardens, I wanted to give a heads up to Slide Quest because it's two games in one. It's a game for children if you play it without the app, and it's a game for masochists if you play it with the app. <laughs> and uh, honestly, I had an absolutely superb time with it at like, I think it retails at like 25 pounds, $25. Mm. And uh, for that, you're like, oh my goodness, you'll have a great time. Finish it, give it away. Uh, superb. That was Slide Quest. Hmm. Dun dun dun. War of the Worlds. Not sure how familiar people are with the musical version of War of the Worlds. Was it big over here as well? All right, I was thought the answer was going to be like a big hard no there. I think it's one of the most fun things in the world. Anyway, War of the Worlds is a sequel to War of the Worlds. Um, in which the aliens... <laughs> it does have a subtitle. I, sorry, it's, uh, that doesn't sound as insane as it sounds. So, no, hang on. No. I'm moving past this. It's a sequel to the original story of War of the Worlds, where aliens come down to Earth, uh, wipe out everyone with ease, and then have to leave because they get the common cold. Spoilers! Um, sorry, it did come out like about 80 years ago. Yeah. Anyway, it's great, and if you're going to get familiar with War of the Worlds, if you've not listened to the musical version of it, it's a couple of albums, and it's absolutely amazing. I recommend it for cleaning the house. Brilliant. Because <laughs> um, it's got gaps in it, where it's like a monologue, and you think, I'm going to have to sit down and have a cup of tea. And then, oh, the, nice. and then the red weed comes in, and the bass, and then you're like, yeah, it's time to go and start polishing the, that the bit window. With, the bit with the priest who's gone mad because he's been yeah. in the sewers for too long, yeah. and he starts talking about how we'll build a society in the sewers and play cricket in yeah. the sewers. Build a whole new world down here. Oh, so good. I love it. So anyway, good. so this is why I started playing the War of the Worlds board game, because I absolutely love War of the Worlds. Now, the first most striking thing about the War of the Worlds board game is the fact that the board that it has is square, and it makes the United Kingdom look really squished. <laughs> and arguably that's because it's like a perspective thing, but I mean, it just looks like a fat little UK, and I, that made me smile. The way the game works is it's a deck building game where you're basically spending cards to buy more cards from a little shop of your own personal cards. But it's asymmetrical, so you have the aliens versus, spoilers, the humans. In this case, <laughs> literally the United Kingdom. <laughs> the manual is just so devoid of flavor text, it's stunning. It just says the objective of this game is for the humans to deal 30 points of damage to the aliens <laughs> and for the aliens to completely eradicate all civilians in the United Kingdom. <laughs> The idea that it's just about that first time where they got the cold, and they're like, you know, we don't want this planet, but these guys, we're going to kill them. <laughs> they're done. And the way the game works is you start off, and as the alien, you just have weird, creepy tech that's just like, I'm going to put a strange building in Scotland, because they start in Scotland this time. That's thematically appropriate. Yeah, and then um, as 
the humans, you just have like refugees and let like, you play a refugee card and it just means like people are just going to run away. So really all you can do initially is just move civilians around the UK by making them run away or get them to fight as guerrillas and do a bit of damage to the aliens. It's really fascinating though and it took me a while to get my head around it because when you're playing it, you're playing this game with hands of cards and you're gradually buying stuff from your own shop because obviously the humans are buying jeeps and spitfires and stuff. And oh yeah, you said to me in the in the taxi to the that this yeah. is after the War of the Worlds, so the humans have fought the tripods once, but then when they came back it's like we'll have a crack again yeah. with it's a like, car. They've not got any, they've not like used any of the technology from last time or improved at all. It's still just like what, what, ho, ho, oh yes, jolly good, but this time, they've this time they've got a shot of winning? Doesn't really w make sense. Um, but it is a lot of fun in the fact that basically as the humans, you're just legging it away whilst the aliens gradually develop power and then start to come across the map with tremendous force. And the thing is, you can't actually kill any of the alien units in it. Really? Which is actually kind of a really neat thing. Basically, you do damage to the aliens and it makes the damage tracker at the side go up. And when you get to 30, you mysteriously win, which admittedly, I just don't think makes any sense. But it's quite exciting when you realize you're like, oh, I built this tank and I'm going to do this. And then this walker walks down and kills stuff and you go, oh, that's really bad. But it's fine because I'll be able to take that territory back. And it's like, no, you can't. Like, <laughs> you can't destroy or even hurt any of the units. You just have to run away. And it means that the whole game is basically you just trying to consolidate and get all of the civilians to go to maybe one place in the UK where you, sounds, tr you try and bunker down. That sounds really thematic. It is. It actually, like, in terms of the mechanics, it's super thematic, especially in the fact that, like, you know, you build tanks, you build big warships, and then they can do damage to the aliens, but everything has one health. Like, you know, it's the same as civilians. It's like, if your tank gets hit by anything, it's dead. Like, immediately. There's no armor. So it, it's cool. It's like you're just firing at things with ships and hoping that they're not going to turn around and go, Oi, stop it. And then they're like... Um, <laughs> oh, I like how the audience definitely knew exactly what you were doing with that noise. Yeah. That's the noise of a, such a high-tech alien laser, you know it cannot be stopped. It, no, that noise is... Oh, no, I thought you were doing the... Which was, is, the and then everything blows up. That's the, the heat row. He goes... I'm not going to get into this with you. <laughs> Doesn't know what he's talking about. Oh. What's the name of the big warship that will definitely defeat the war? Thunderchild. Yeah! <laughs> so basically for most of the time I was playing this, I was just singing the World of War, war of the Worlds theme tune whilst playing it. It's kind of neat. It's a bit shonky. Um, there's elements of it. There's definitely like, there's like the, the deluxe version comes with little plastic miniatures, which just actually aren't as good as the 2D, two dimensional cardboard bits you get in the basic game, because it's one of those games where 2D stand up cardboard bits are perfect because it's a head to head game. So you, you're always both looking at things from a flat on, you know, it's just like, come on, don't need 3D. <laughs> We're being 2D, let's just be 2D together. Also the art on the 2D cutouts is lovely. It fits with the board, it fits with the cards. The models are different color plastics, whatever. Um, and it is really fun kind of watching it unfold and realizing that like you have to wait ages to get a card that lets you have a tank and then the tank just gets blown up immediately. <laughs> um, it really does kind of engender you with that horror. And I had a great time because I played really terribly and I kept just, because I didn't know what to do in the early game because I didn't have a tank. I just kept sending civilians one by one up into Scotland to try and fight the aliens on their own. <laughs> just like a man running into Scotland from Yorkshire and then just being like, yeah, mate, you bastards. <laughs> and then it just being like, mm. <laughs> like but this is one by one. And it took me maybe like, the first half of the game before I looked across the table to a friend of ours, Clark, who was playing against me and I'm like, I'm not sure this this is a good this is a good idea. <laughs> Just being like watching as the north of England is decimated because someone from London goes, "Now listen up, chat. You're gonna <laughs> you're gonna have to keep running up there. I know you're not actually technically in the military, but it's the only way we're gonna stop these dastardly things." <laughs> what do you mean, Glasgow's God? <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's I can't like. I, I, I want to play more of this, really, to be honest, because I, I didn't I didn't love it as much as I was expecting to love it, considering how much I love the source material. Right. Um, but it's neat. It's remarkably simple, which is crazy, because the manual is just one of the worst things I've ever seen. I think the, the, the first, it's like 10 stages to set up the game, when the first stage set of setting up the game is, decide between you which of you is going to be the aliens or which is going to be the humans. You know? Right. Okay, and it's like second stage of setup put the board in the middle of the table. <laughs> and it's just like, it's basically the manual for this game is kind of like a magic eye puzzle where every page of the manual has one rule on it, but you have to find it. <laughs> and yeah, but- um, Oh, there's an expansion as well, right? Yeah, I the haven't Irish, tried that yet with the Irish Sea. What does it add? Ireland. 
and presumably <laughs> the sea around Ireland. <laughs> Uh, I haven't checked it out. Oh, I want to check it, it out. It would be so good if it added Ireland, but Ireland was just like fused to the side of the UK. Like, a- I mean, there was there was one thing about it. Like, there were some promo cards that come with it. I don't know. It's sometimes it's hard to tell when we get sent games what's in the actual game game. You have to go and check it out online properly. But there was a dog that had a radio strapped to its back, and it basically allowed you to do intel. But then at any point, you could just discard the dog for one damage to the aliens, and it's just like. Oh. <laughs> Honestly, like, it's not bad. It might be good. I just, I wouldn't like to commit to that at this point. But if you're a big fan of War of the Worlds like me and you want to just sit there going, dun, 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 then it's not bad. It will not disappoint you. Can confirm. I think probably maybe the best IPs to base board games on are ones that have a really distinctive soundtrack that you can put on in the background. Mm. Would the X-Wing Miniatures game be as good if you couldn't put Star Wars music on? Maybe, actually, we might find that out because Dis- with Disney's like legal team coming in. <laughs> but I heard they're going to knock on your door soon, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely stuff. Well, that, that, was, that was War of the Worlds from, uh, is it Grey Fox? I think so, yeah. Maybe? I'm not 100%, but I'm pretty sure. Oh, this is another game you played, Fantastic uh, Yeah, I'll talk Factories. about this really briefly. It's absolutely fine. I just really got bothered by the art design, um, and I, I just wanted to kind of like work out how bad a person I am. I feel awful because <laughs> I get annoyed about art design in a way that I just feel is really petulant and bad, and it makes me a bad person. But it really bothered me that in this game, I felt like they just had two artists that had no communication whatsoever and the fact that half of the cards in the game look like funny little Lego people. Should we just say the name again for the people listening to the podcast? Fantastic Factories, which is like a little builder, dice builder thing, spend dice to get things, to get things, to do things. It's fine. Like, (laughs) I didn't think it was either really good or really bad. I thought it was just, it's fine. Um, But it's like half the art and it doesn't have black outlines and half of it does. Half the people on the cards look like actual wooden meeples and half of them look like Lego people. That's all I've really got to say about Fantastic Factories, but <laughs> but it really it really just bothered me, and I just I just had to get it out of my system. Good, Do you feel so, better? Yeah, I, I think so. Oh, I'm excited to talk about this next game. Uh, <clears throat> some of you might have played this one already. This is Paranormal Detectives from Lucky Duck, who did Chronicles of Crime, a game we thought was almost great. Mm. Paranormal Detectives, I'm here to tell you, is also, I'm going to say almost great, but I love it. I really, really like it. So I thought this was kind of like uh, Mysterium, because Paranormal Detectives, what this is, it's competitive, but you have one player who's dead. That doesn't sound like a great competitive starting place. (laughs) Uh, Okay, I've got good news for you. If you're the ghost, the dead ghost, you always win, so that's good. Um, And then it's just a case of which player you win with. Um, So you are given as the ghost, because I was, when we sat down to play Paranormal Detectives, I was quite tired, so it's like, who wants to be the ghost? And I went, oh, me, because it means I don't have to talk, right? Sure enough, in the style of Mysterium, you do not have to talk, but to begin with. (laughs) Okay, so you as the ghost are given a card with an incredibly detailed grisly story of how you died, which is somewhat distressing. And then a board with all of this nonsense, like tarot cards and a little Ouija board and a ghost detector and some string um, and more is placed in front of you. All of the traditional detective tools. (laughs) How long is this ghost? (laughs) (laughs) Uh... Sorry, no, no, I'm just thinking of how deep is your love with the word love replaced with ghost. How long is your ghost? Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so then uh, players around the table who are paranormal detectives have to work out how you died. Uh, they have to, <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, standard journalism thing of like, who, who killed you? Why did they kill you? What did kill you? When did kill and you? And why? And why did kill you dead? Um, I, I'm getting that slightly wrong, and that's irritating because um, those questions are actually tremendously important. And one of the big problems with paranormal detectives is, uh, as we'll see in a minute, sometimes figuring out why you died is when you have to give exactly the reason, because it's often a one or two word answer, is very tricky. Yeah. But what's fabulous about this game is players take turns to play a card from your hand. and the car- So you ask a question to the ghost and play a card. Mm-hmm. And this is superb. And you're going to write down the answers behind your screen, because the question you ask might be, you know, what was the, uh, what was the, what was the killer thinking when they mm. killed you? You know, you can ask anything, and this is a fabulously open-ended system. You can ask any question. It's limited only by your imagination when you're trying to figure out stuff. And of course, some, some of the answers are secret, so you might be trying to ask questions that give you information without giving other detectives. But what's, what s- summarizes why Paranormal Detectives is so, so good is you might be asking, what was going through the killer's head? Use these pieces of string to, to show it. And then the ghost might have been killed by a jellyfish. <laughs> So the, the thing that powers Paranormal Detectives is that all of the implements you have to express yourself as the ghost 
are awful. Yeah. You know, what time of day did you die? Use these 12 tarot cards. I think I saw something, or it may have been on Instagram uh, or in my dreams, of you trying to draw a clue on someone's back with your finger. Oh, yeah. It's like, you know, who killed you? But you have to draw on my back with a finger. You have to trace it. <laughs> uh, you have, the pieces of string are fabulous because they're not even string. They've got wire in, so you can't even make curves or straight lines. You really, really, they're also really short. You've got a Ouija board so you can spell stuff out, but there's only four Four Ouija tokens, <laughs> so you can only make a four-word anagram. The ghost detector is like, I don't know, made by Mattel or something, because it's got seven <laughs> sliders, which are hot to cold, you know, big to small. That's one big hot ghost. It's a... <laughs> <laughs> Wooey! <laughs> We got ourselves a toaster. But for real, it'll be like, what was the murder weapon? And then on a ghost detector, where you're like, well, it was about, because the sliders are like little pieces yeah. of wood or like cardboard, you start up and down. It's like, well, the murder weapon was about this long. It was about this warm. On a scale of one to knife. <laughs> But, 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 as funny as this is, oh, also, there's an amount of charades. I was not expecting this, and you should know it before going into Paranormal Detectives, because yeah. I thought, oh, I'll be the ghost, I'll be chill, giving out chill, cool ghost clues. And then the first thing I was told to do was mime the final three seconds of your life. <laughs> uh... It has to be three seconds, and this was extra tricky because I was. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spoil how I died. But there's a whole crap ton of cards. I was a ghost who, a, a woman, a girl who died in the bath while blow drying her hair, and dropped the hair dryer. So mime that, everybody. Uh, so yeah, but and yet it's absolutely hilarious. And but the thing that makes it super good is not just the players can be really clever with questions, mm. but. We're so used to it, like in Sherlock, you know, um, uh, games that will leave clues delicately out, and it's a puzzle you're meant to solve. But in Paranormal Detectives, <laughs> you have like the most bizarre answers based on two bits of string and three seconds of charades. And you're trying to connect the dots, like a, it's, you know, you, you know, but the dots might not even ever be there. Right, kind of. And yet, and yet, every time I've played this, players have had moments of going, <gasps> Oh my god, it's, he got killed by a plane that landed on him! <laughs> I'm gonna tell you now, that was not what happened in our game. But tell you what, you feel so clever when you like connect the dots. So yeah, Paranormal Detectives, um, fascinating, it's funny, it is occasionally extremely clever, it's mm. unique, it's super simple, there's like a couple of pages of rules, it's a little finickety, but by and large, Paranormal Detectives, really, really good. Yeah. And so between Chronicles of Crime and this, I'm- I feel like if you like a dramatic edge to your detective evenings, that seems like a pretty pretty strong contender. It's, it's like a, the best game for kind of like, I mean, anyone, any, I'm sure most people in this room would have a great time with it, but it's like the best game for like drama students or yeah. like, I don't know, you know what I mean? Yeah, like it's the thing of, if you like those detective games, but you're not afraid to stand up and pretend that you, I don't know, yeah, a plane landed on you. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, so yeah, I don't want to spoil any more, but it's fascinating, it's silly, it's a, a lovely thing. Hey guys, let's talk about Blitzkrieg. Woo! Uh, any yeah. fans of- uh, Any fans of Blitzkrieg? No, no. <laughs> Get out! Yeah, not not cool, not cool. But no, no, the game. Oh yeah, the game is great. It's, it's World War Two in twenty minutes. It says cheerily on the front cover of the box, which never ceases to crack me up. Um, <laughs> uh, and yeah, I was handed this by a publisher. Who said it'd be a really big hit with families at Essen, which I thought, <laughs> okay, like. I believe it, but I just... In what sense did he mean hit? I have no idea, but no, I uh, I gave it a go, and uh, it's really fun. It's a tiny board, it's about, like, you know, yay big, it's about a foot by half a foot, and uh, this... <laughs> we, the... Yeah, that's really... We should describe all board games in terms of length in feet. Yes. <laughs> I, I was, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, um, on this photograph, it has lots of little army men on the spaces, but the version I had just has some nice little wooden cubes. So it's very simple, very, very minimalist. And the way the game works is quite simple. You have the five theatres of war, um, which are, of course, the Pacific Ocean, the Eastern Europe one, the Africa, the Middle East one, and the South Asia, and the other one. There's loads of theatres, and they're all very good. And the way it works <laughs> is it's the Axis versus the Allies, and you both have bags of things, and you pull out tokens from your bags. Are you having a stroke? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. So the way it works is the Axis and the Allies both have a little bag, and every turn you pull out some <laughs> things from your little bag, and you put them behind your little screen. And these tokens are things that you can then place on one of the theatres. And the theatres have these different layers that you have to fill up, like slots. Hmm. And every time you fill up a space with a unit, 
you would get that bonus. And you can see there's blue slots and there's brown slots and there's like ones that are half and half. It's boat places and land places. Okay. And obviously planes can do whatever they want. Right. Those don't apply to planes. Um, and sometimes you just get points. Sometimes you get to build another unit, which means pulling something extra out of the bag. Sometimes you get more points in that theater. So you get bonus points of like winning the war in that part of the world. Or sometimes you can drop bombs on the other players, uh, a kind of reinforcement area. And basically the way it works is as you move along, every time you fill up a line in one of these things, that theater scores and you get a certain amount of points on the area, but then also you get bonus points if your army is winning on that side of things. So it's basically an abstract war game and it means you want to try and push along the thing as far as you can and then finish off the area mm. so that you get a whole bunch of points. Yeah, I'm looking at the uh, the picture of it uh, right now for the people at home and they it, it's actually a very elegant looking little thing. It is. It's very simple. It's very clean. It doesn't take long to teach. and. What's really fun about it is the fact that, yeah, you, you can do these things like, oh, the factory token the marker just means you can pull out another unit or two from your bag and put them behind your screen. That's kind of boring. You can only place one every turn. But then you've got a much more exciting one, the research. The research one lets you randomly take one of the special tokens in the middle Ooh. and put it into your bag. And that could be anything. It could be like a really good plane or a really good tank <laughs> or a nuclear bomb. What? Yeah, which is just crazy. It just like wins you one area pretty much, but then messes up all the other ones around it. Oh, wow. Which is fun. But you're going to have to, yeah. I'm so, I, I mean, I don't know if I should like try and embed the YouTube apology video into this or not. I don't I, I, like, Does that save time? Does that make it worse? I should probably wait a week, disappear, kind of lay low and then come back. I'm so sorry. Look, I'll think about this later. Anyway. Um, the, most, the rule that made, made this game really pop to life for me was the fact that you can drop bombs on your opponent's stuff. And the way that works is if you do that, then you just get to reach behind their screen and randomly take one of their things wow. and put it back in their bag. And what's wonderful about that is if at any point in the game you cannot play a unit, you lose. Oh, nice. So you've got this kind of constant push back and forth, yep. but with a second win condition. So you've got all these different areas of the board. You're always trying to hold them off in areas, push forward in other areas. But then if you push your luck and you just try and get all this research and you try and like, you know, get all these really cool things, if it doesn't land, if the other player starts to work out, hang on a minute, like you haven't got many options of what to place. You have to place a tank this turn. If I drop a bomb on you, Maybe I'll kill your tank. This is tingling my spider sense. It's this actually, looks really good. It's actually really neat. Like, I've played it a few times. It's super fast. Um, it's not amazing. It's not the sort of thing you play it and you're like, this is genius. But it's it's so light and so fast. I had a really good time with it. Uh, my dad, as is often the case with lots of middle-aged men, uh, loves World War II. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I'm probably going to play, play it with him at Christmas. I think he'll like it. Because I tried memoir with him. It was a bit much. Three, turns out three different bits. Three so different. five will be fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, yeah, Blitzkrieg. It's just a tiny little thing I stumble on. It's fun. I've realized we didn't tell the uh, hilarious anecdote uh, that we were going to tell at the top of the podcast of the question I got asked in airport security. Oh, that was good. Yeah, some, it in. Sometimes they try and trip you up when you're coming into America. They want to ask to see if you really are who you are. So uh, I was being grilled by, uh, by a uh, guy and he said, uh, yeah, what do you do for a living? And I said, I make videos on YouTube. And he went, oh yeah? What's YouTube's website? <laughs> Which, to be fair, almost flustered me so much I could have been denied if I went, uh, I don't work YouTube.com? And he went, this way, sir. <laughs> I've been thinking about that a lot since that happened. I'm, thinking, <laughs> I'm like, he got it. Right. YouTube.com. Uh, well, we got, oh, goodness me. Oh, God. Here we go. Let's talk about Eco's first continent. This was a game I played a little while ago. Uh, I don't want to get anyone too excited, but it's not that good. <clears throat> um, but what you have here, this is a, it's got a fantastic concept and uh, it's a super engaging hook. Eco's first continent sees all the players working kind of, sort of, as gods making Africa, but a bad Africa. How bad an Africa? Depends on you and your friends. <clears throat> so, on your turn, uh, you, uh, you, there's kind of nothing on the table in the middle. <laughs> you, you, you're right. I know, I just, I just, I just really want to be like, is CIA involved? <laughs> um, Stop. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, on your, you're going to have cards uh, which sort of represent different godly powers. Everyone starts with completely different ones because the deck is entirely unique. So, and then on your turn, you draw one of these, or no, you, you 
a pl basically, a, a player is drawing these lovely, beautiful, wooden, sort of um, manner looking tokens. They kind of look like um, early artwork from a sort of primitive human people. Um, and so you might have a sun, and then everyone gets to place a sort of sun cube on their sun powers, which basically, it's, it's a fancy way of saying, like, event, occasionally players go, I can do this, and you pop a power, and you will like unleash this burst of godly magic that means you can make a tree. Or, or an antelope. Imagine that. Um, players all have different powers, but you're all sharing, you know, this sort of early Africa. You know, maybe I put, you, you might have just like a bit of savanna and some desert, mm -hmm. and someone puts down some water. Someone makes the water bigger. But lots of these cards you're using as you get these, you know, sort of wooden pieces that mean, oh, I can do this. It might be place a tree and then get a victory point for every tree in that contiguous lump of trees. Mm. So, uh, I've got my notes here. Uh, what do I have here? Basically, players are slowly building out the continent, getting points. It's kind of lovely. It's kind of collaborative. This three-dimensional thing with wooden mountains and wooden trees and sea and sky. It it's, comes with a little slidey box that keeps all of the animals and things in one Yeah, thing. it does. It's a, lots of publishers are doing really clever things with uh, storage solutions at the minute. But eventually, players are going to start using their powers to put animals in Africa. That's when there's a problem. That's when everything goes to shit. <laughs> Um, so, I know, but honestly, I, it's the only way to describe what happens next, because here's the thing, it's kind of like roads and boats. Again, don't want to blow anyone's mind, animals don't belong to anyone, but you will feel like they belong to you. It's a natural human thing. So you might put down, like, a hippo, and then someone else might, you know, draw a thing that lets them move the hippo and just plow your hippo into the sea, just like, bump. <laughs> Why would they do that? But that's okay. Well, it's weird because everyone that's scores okay. in, in different ways. Well, they might be trying to create a scoring thing of like a big contiguous lump like of animals. Most drowned hippos. <laughs> Well, hippos actually do okay in the sea, but what's lovely about the game is animals all do different things, but because only the person bringing on the animal will probably be drafting cards that, like, let them do things with the animal, mm -hmm. you saw I put down a gorilla and everyone goes, oh god, what does it do? <laughs> and the answer might be nothing. It just hangs out in a mountain all the time. And lots of the animals don't do anything. You might have a pelican. It's a pelican. What does it do? It's just a pelican. It's just hanging out. It sort of lulls you into this false sense of security. Maybe someone moves your hippos into the sea. You've got hippos in the sea. That's fine. I kind of forgot the hippos are quite good with water. Yeah, there you go. I was, I was, well, not salt water that. necessarily. I was going to say it's in the water. It's it, hippos can survive in the water. Okay. In fact, in the picture, you've uh, I can see there are some hippos. There's some now. hippos in the sea. I'm sorry, I overreacted. I got I got stressed at the idea. Well, here's the thing. Uh, you might have like all your hippos in the sea. You might start putting more hippos in the sea, and then because there's lots of things in the game that might come out, someone might just maybe put a little shark in the game. Oh. <laughs> the audience is like genuinely upset about uh, this thing. But like lots of the animals, and this is this is the high point of Ecos. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that people buy it, but I did have a lot of fun with it at points in the game when if that shark activates, it can move like eight hexes. It can move around all of Africa and eat everything. Like literally everything. The w and the way that lions work is genuinely like, when I found the rule, I was like, that's awesome because it's, you can put a lion into a pride, but when you sort of move the lions, every single lion in the pride can move and it eats everything it touches. So the lions are just like this awful, it's like the warriors, you know? You just get gangs of animals that show up and then suddenly all the lions, whom, suddenly everything is dead. Um, which is pretty neat. Um, uh, yeah, but not necessarily uh, a great, great thing, but uh, that's Eco's first continent. If you want to have a nice time pushing a hippo in the sea, you can get it. I wouldn't tell you it's a bad idea. Matt, what do you got? Hippos in the sea, that is what we are. I just had to get that out. Um, Valley of the Kings. This is a game that came out, I believe, in 1999. So another modern game for you guys I mean played. But this is a deluxe modern version. There's no way it came out in 99. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's 2009. That sounds... Had a nine in it. That's probably also not true. Had a nine. It doesn't matter. 2019. It's I'm out. pretty sure this deluxe edition came out in 2019. Oh no, the deluxe version just came out. I'm talking yeah. about the original game. That's like four years ago. Okay. Well, I don't know things. <laughs> yeah, right no, now. that's fine. Like, that's it, fine. The numbers in my head and the numbers in the world, sometimes they don't align, sometimes they do. Valley of the Kings. Reality is perception. It is. These days, it really is. Uh, Valley of the Kings is this is a deluxe game version of an older game, unspecified age. And it comes with big, chunky cards, and it's basically a set building game where you want to be like, I want to collect all of these. Uh, nice tables. I want to collect all of these nice amulets or nice weapons or things. And it's based in ancient Egypt, the time of the pharaohs. And the fun thing about it is you're collecting things 
and then you're putting them into your tomb because that's how that you... That sounds yeah. fun. Yeah, right. People say you can't take it with you, but if you're in ancient Egypt, you can. Absolutely can. 100%, which means what you do is you've got these cards and then every turn you can always put one of your cards from your hand into your tomb. And it's just like, it's in there then. That's going to score you points at the end of the game. Anything that does not go into your tomb at the end of the game, not worth anything. It's either in your tomb or nobody cares because you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. This is also a game where you have a nice little pyramid of cards that you can buy from the shop. And you can only ever buy things from the bottom of the pyramid. And then the pyramid sort of slides down, which I think is a lovely thematic bit of colour in terms of like, oh, it's a pyramid of cards. But also the idea of pyramids being these things that just like crumble all the time and <laughs> fall apart is like, I don't know about that. I think, <laughs> I mean, I think like historically pyramids have kind of proven themselves as maybe being the most solid structures <laughs> ever, maybe. Um, but you buy things and then you add them to your hand. So it's a game where you're basically building a deck of cards and you can also get rid of cards in the fact that you're putting them into your tomb. Mm -hmm. But you also then, it starts to have lots of wacky abilities. And this deluxe version of the game comes with all of the expansions they made for this older game. And there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. But it's interesting because it means you can be like, well, I can only put one card into my tomb every turn. But then if I use this card, I can put a second one into my tomb in the same turn. Wow. That's huge. But I have to sacrifice another card to do that. Okay. Sacrificing a card just means I just put it in the, the collective bin of the game. So I got rid of two cards. That's fine. Because anyone who's played a game where you're building decks is you're buying better cards. And then as you do, you want to get rid of the ones that are rubbish. So you can have this wonderfully slick Egyptian machine that slides into a tomb. It's very standard. The problem is about this game. Wow. Is that everything is wacky as hell. And effectively, you'll get cards which say, oh, it says if I play this card, I can take the top card off of your discard pile or anyone's discard pile. Oh, if I play this card, everyone else has to sacrifice cards. And so it's kind of got a little element of kind of cosmic-y take thatness. And you can protect against it by having the right cards. But if, say, like me, you've gotten rid of all the cards that protect you because you didn't think you really needed them, you're suddenly in a huge amount of trouble. This is one of the few... Uh, kind of deck builder games where I've got to the end of it and it hasn't been like, oh, well, you know, I tried to do this thing. It didn't really work that well. They've done very well. Fair enough. It was me just going, I'm screwed. I'm absolutely <laughs> ruined. I've been ruined for like four turns. It's a deck building game where I ended up at the end of the game, I had four cards in my hand. In and your like, deck? In my deck. My deck was <laughs> my deck was four cards and you can draw five cards every turn. <laughs> and it's like, it just went so badly. Um, which was wonderful because it has all these things of being like, you know, you get these great cards, but then you're like, well, I want to put that in my tomb because it will score. But then you're like, where's that really good card I had? It's like, I put it in my tomb. Oh no. And again, because it's wacky, you can get stuff out of your tomb and swap in things. Oh, what? That's a weird thing, isn't it? You'd be like, I'm just gonna, but like no one will notice if I change the necklace in this tomb, <laughs> it'd be fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's just, I found it fabulously interesting and fun in the fact that what I did in this game was I did the thing you do when you're doing a deck builder. I got rid of the stuff and I had it perfectly smooth. And I was like, this is a great deck. And then everyone else just kept making me take cards out of my deck. And then it, it, it fell apart so hard. <laughs> it was spectacularly bad. I, got this, I bought this card, it cost me a fortune. It's like, I can use this card every time it comes up to take a card from my discard pile and put it straight into my tomb. That's crazy, that's huge. I then just didn't have a discard pile for the entire <laughs> game. It was like, I was just like, and I pick them all up again, I guess, and I play with these again. Yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting. It's one of those games where it looks super dry and um, especially the box, you know, the premium edition of this is just a black box that says Valley of the Kings in a nice font. It's just mm. one of the most plain looking things you've ever seen. And the art is very nice. The graphic design is very nice, but it's nothing about it which is inherently like poppy or exciting. Um, but I think the way it plays is just fascinating and toothy and, and pretty wonderful. AEG so, yeah. put out, you know, Trains, one of Shut Up and Sit Down's favorite yeah. deck builders, and now Valley of the Kings is secret, quietly, some of the best deck building games around, we yeah. think. Yeah, it's great. Just being able to put trash into other people's hands is just, <laughs> just amazing. You'd be like, yeah, I'm just going to put this card into your discard pile. They're like, I don't want this. It's like, but it's yours now. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Should we move on? Yeah. Boom. Okay. Hey, right. Uh, we're going to talk about a little party game called Medium next. Uh, we've got an actual sidekick in the audience. 
That's lovely. So we are going to, rather than uh, rather than get into what medium is, because, I mean, I can teach it to you, like, uh, okay, fine, I'm going to get into what it is, because that would be weird otherwise. <clears throat> um, so medium is a game where you've got a hand of cards with words on, and you go around the table, and on your turn, you turn to the player to your left, so it's like two people playing at any one time, and it's about a game about trying to forge psychic links, yeah? Across, like, spiritual dimensions. And what that means is that on your turn, you're going to play a card that might be like, you know, table, and then they play a card from their hand, which might be, uh, you know, uh, water. And then the whole table can go three, two, one, and then you say the word. Or the two players have to say the word at the same time that links table and water. Now, I just came up with these to two words at the top of my head, but to demonstrate how this game works, Matt and I are going to play it right now. Are we those words? Yeah, we can do table and water. We can have a couple of stabs at this. I came up with table and water. Next time we can get some, uh, some suggestions from the audience. But So you're going to get points if you match the first time, otherwise you get a couple more attempts. But this game is... I'll say now, you'll probably see how it works. It is unbelievably tense and incredibly frustrating. And when you get it right, absolutely superb. I had two friends. Uh, the two words they played were hang, H-A-N-G, hang, and janitor. And then it was three, two, one. And they both said executioner at the same time. <laughs> and it was like, it was simultaneously hilarious. They couldn't believe they matched. They high-fived. It was like the highlight of that game night. But also, it makes you think. Make you think. <laughs> Meanwhile, we have table and table water. Table and water. You ready? Okay. Can we, can we have some tense music, I believe? But also, the manual specifies that I love this. Oh, stop. Stop the tense music. Sorry, I'm still talking. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have to apologize to the sound people later. Um, no, the manual specifies when you're counting down, you have to look each other in the eye to better forge the psychic link. Uh, so we're going to need to do this with the it's mics. Like clinking drinks with Italians. Okay, right. Okay, right, right. Can we have the dramatic music, please? Jug. Yeah! That was pretty easy. That's pretty easy. That was pretty easy. Should we just do that one more time? We got some. Do you, someone in the audience want to shout out a word? Geography, I heard. <laughs> De geography and donuts. Okay. I am okay. immediately good to go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Right. Can we have the dramatic music, please? America. Shop. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Matt's was better. Uh, <clears throat> however, the game isn't over there because if two people play it to connect, so we have America and shop, you can then go again. But you can't say any of the, pr any of the two linking words, so you've now got two new words. So we can't say donut and we mm -hmm. can't say geography. Mm -hmm. But oh, we, damn. We know. <laughs> so now we have to find the link between shop and America. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. Can we have the, No, let's just do yeah. one. It's three, three, two, two one. More. Malt. That's nuts. I was going to say Walmart. But you didn't. And I changed it to mall. Why'd you okay, do this? You get one last shot. <laughs> and Not usually. Walmart and mall? This is when players have backed themselves into a corner and it gets uh. really hard. Okay. And then this is actually usually the point in the game where players then stare into space looking sad for about 45 seconds. Walmart and mall. Yeah, if you guys can just give us a second. Okay, okay I'm good. Okay. Uh. Yeah, th there's no way. Three, Three two, one. Retail. retail. Yeah! <laughs> oh. I've never in my life been excited at saying the word retail. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's Medium, a little party game that you can get. There is an expansion for Medium called, I don't know, it doesn't matter. I would say you don't need to buy it. It's got new word cards. <laughs> Um, it does let you, it gives another card that you can sort of play to, I forget what it does. It's, it's definitely not worth the money unless It's the conclusive review. <laughs> <laughs> all I'm saying, it's the kind of expansion you should only buy if you've completely yeah, exhausted yeah, all the course. cards in the base set. What I will say in Medium that's great is that uh, everyone has two power cards in front of them. One that lets you junk your hand, but the other lets you um, get in on two other players' mind meld. So if two players are about to go and you go, oh, 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 I know what they're going to say, you can go in. And this lead, this is only ever funny because if, because what's <laughs> hilarious is you go, let me do this. Three person mind meld, let's go. And then if those two players match and you screw it up, <laughs> it's like side splittingly funny. Just like... <laughs> yeah, no, it's like, we've got this. You can, 
You can stay out. I'll, I'll see you guys later. Okay. <laughs> It's been good being psyched together, guys. But I got a, I got a, got I got a, a thing. If, do you have my number? You can call me. I got a thing. I've, you've, you can text as well. I'm on WhatsApp. Oh, oh, we're, we're running oh, out of time. Yeah, this is a are. real shame because we have some very, very good games uh, to blitz through briefly. This is Confidence. This is a very, uh, a very small publisher. It's just taken off in the UK, I believe, because it's from two YouTube, UK YouTubers. Uh, don't let that put you off. Confident is a trivia game where all the answers are numbers. Uh, in questions that you would never know the answer to. So most importantly, we started this game and we knew it was amazing because the question was, how many bones does a blue whale have? Okay? And the way it works very simply is all the players then simultaneously write down the range. So what is the minimum number of bones you think it has? For example, four. I think it was like in its fin. No, no, it was just in the whale. Really? I remember this. I thought someone wrote six. <laughs> and I don't think anyone would think that a whole whale would only have six bones. Well, this is why it's funny, because probably from around the table, someone's bottom and top range will be hilarious. But, um, but then, then you write the top range, which, uh, hilariously, for uh, the Shut Up and Sit Down, uh, Shut Up and Sit Down managers, Chris, he wrote that a blue whale would have a maximum of, ooh, about 600 bones. <laughs> Uh, it was like, oh no, wasn't it like 6,000? It was like 10,000 like 10, Oh no, he wrote like, 10,000. You know, it was like, it no, was like the, a lot of bones. A blue whale has 600 bones, he wrote something like 8,000. Yeah, <laughs> it's, I mean, it, it, when you're put under pressure with these things, it, you really give some terrible answers, which makes it very funny. It was even the fact that like, what's lovely about this game is the fact that you can swap two players' results. So if you think someone's going to do really well and they're already winning, you can be like secretly go, you know what, this round, I'm swapping you and you. So, you know, if you get points, the other person gets points. And you can copy, which never goes well. <laughs> because you, you always just think that person will know. We have one which is to do with like, the figures around Brexit or something, and they were like, well, they'll know, and we just couldn't quite remember. And, yeah, uh, yeah. And we ruined it. But some lovely questions, you know, how many pounds of cheese does a Danish person eat in a year, knowing that Danes eat more pounds of cheese per year than anyone else? How many movies does Arnold Schwarzenegger say, like, we have to get out or yeah. something? I, I think it was like, how many lines were there in Predator or something? Oh, how many lines does Arnold Schwarzenegger have in Terminator? Yeah, That's it. Yeah, so, but there's lots of them. I think I got, I got a bit annoyed with this because I got the sense that some of the things, like how many bones are in a whale, were like, that's a fact, but some of them clearly clearly had been taken from like Google. Uh, well, Google, which would then lead you to uh, stat-based stories in like online publications, which came from PR agencies, which came from samples of like 30 people. So it yeah, was like, yeah, yeah. it was something like, what percentage of people in the United Kingdom play a board game on Christmas day? And the answer was like 90%. And it's like, that's not true. <laughs> like, that's we just, personally know enough families for not that true. to not be true. So there, it wasn't perfect, but yeah, as a first time thing, it's very cool. And we had a really fun night with it. Yeah, that's, so that's Confidence, a little trivia game uh, that you may not expect. Hmm. And then finally we'll end on bus. Here we... Who likes buses? <laughs> so we started this podcast talking about a splotter game. We're going to end it uh, talking about an, an, another splotter game, uh, first published a while back, but now being republished by Capstone Games, absolutely fantastic publisher. Uh, bus. Right. Oh, God. Bus is a game about making bus routes, okay? A little bit like Ticket to Ride. On your turn, you can, you know, make a couple of routes. You can elongate your route around town. You can bring new passengers in. You can deliver passengers to bars or home. You can buy new buses to your network. Or you can dilate the flow of time. <laughs> but obviously, as with normal, like, games about buses and bus routes, uh, there are only a certain number of time dilation crystals that you can use. <laughs> before you actually destroy the flow of time and the game immediately ends. Yeah, so uh, when we were setting this game up, it has a, uh, a victory point track around the edge of the board. Um, we should also stress the new Capstone uh, Games Edition is gorgeous. Yeah. Um, the, we, the only image we could find of the board at this point uh, was uh, a, a, one of the original, oh, well, an older version of the Splotter game. And I mean, honestly, I kind of love it, but it does look like outsider art. Um, whereas the Splotter version is very clean, very gorgeous. Oh, uh, the Capstone version. Capstone, sorry, is, uh, is gorgeous. Uh, but yes, yeah, so, so when we started this, we looked at the points around the track. It's like, wait, so you get a point for delivering any of the games like 30 passengers. And amazingly, like, we had a friend who were teaching it and he said, oh, so I get a point for delivering this guy to work, but then I can just deliver him home again and get another point? It's like, yeah, do you know how buses work? <laughs> Um, but yeah, but the score track only goes up to 20, and it's like, hang on, there's like, we can deliver, how on earth would you only get 20, we, we're gonna get way more than 20 points. At the end of an hour long game of bus, I had got four points. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a funny thing in the fact that it's, it's a bit like, 
It's, it's a bit like the way the passengers work is a bit like kind of a broken SimCity game in the fact that like if they're already at home and they're supposed to be going home, then they just they just stay there. But then they'll just randomly go to any office or bar or home <laughs> that is nearby or not. But it has this thing of being like, well, actually, the problem is... As the time flows between these three different states of time, which is either it's time to work, it's time to go home, or it's time to go to the pub. <laughs> um, and it means the problem is, it's like, oh, if it's time to go to the pub, it's like these bus drivers are driving around being like, there's no customers. Because they're all already in the pub. Yep. Um, it's this awful thing. You finish an eight-hour day at work, and then the time dilation thing goes, and suddenly you need to go back to work again. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't... It's mad. And I completely destroyed Quinns at one point because he was he was just slightly too cocky with the scoring. And he was trying to close off a round with a thing where basically he was going to score four points for delivering four different people. Imagine that. Imagine running a bus route and being so cocky as to want to deliver four people to the pub. Yeah. He wanted to send four people to the pub and he was going to get... And I thought, you know what? No one else is going to get any points from that. That's too many points. So obviously I did what any bus driver would do in that situation. <laughs> I dilated time. <laughs> so suddenly all the people getting ready finishing up their documents thinking oh I'm going to go for a drink no time went back and they had to do their day of work again um, and it meant because they were already all at the office no one could score any points because they, were, they didn't need a bus Yeah, because they were already in the office Yeah, and Quinns was real sad um, <laughs> extraordinarily upset but I, I somehow managed to gel with the, the combination of bus routes and time travel and I was just monstering it. We're coming to them late because a lot of Splatter games uh, have very poor stock availability, but it turns out Splatter is rapidly becoming one of Shut Up and Sit Down's favorite publishers, you know, but if you want to experience Splatter, we recommended Food Chain Magnate before, and now you've got this uh, new version of Bus, uh, which is just absolutely, which is also, let's, I mean, it's funny, but also Bus, absolutely fascinating, if very toothy strategy game. Oh, brutal. I mean, it's, it's one of the original, if not the original worker placement game. Right? Yeah, actually, I believe it predates Kalos, maybe. I don't know if that can be confirmed, but if so, yes, Blossom quietly invented worker placement in a game about a time traveling bus. Yeah. And then let the rest of the board game industry mess around with that. And it is that wonderful thing of uh, the fact that you're trying to plan ahead and the fact that it's so toothy. You just sit there holding on to one of your tokens being like, I really want to do that. And then someone before you does it and you think, okay, fine. <laughs> and it's lovely in the fact that you've got such limited options. But then at the same time, on some of the actions, you have like as many people can do it really as you want. And also like you can take as many actions in your turn as you'd like. Oh yeah. But when you run out of action discs, you're out of get the game. Yeah, it's the, if, if it is the original worker placement game, it also did something I've not seen before. Of You get 20 workers and you put your workers out and at the end of a round, you don't get them back, they go in the bin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what happens if I run out of workers and everyone else still has workers? I just sit there. And that's fine, because I made my own terrible bed. And it's just, I also just love the fact that I, that I repeatedly in this game had turns where I was like, I really want to use that slot on the worker placement game, on the worker placement thing, and then someone else did it, and I'm like, huh, okay, well, guess I'm going to reverse the flow of time. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like a wonderful overreaction to be able to have in a board game. It's like, it's properly like, you know, flipping the fifth dimensional table. Well, it's like when you teach the game, it's like now, okay, you can't, when you're building a bus route, you can't run parallel because the municipal government says that obviously they want to cover as much of the town as possible. Yeah, there are also, yeah. when you take the last time crystal, the world ends. There are really strict rules about bus routes <laughs> in terms of like, obviously we're gonna, you know, and then it's like, yeah, just also don't use the time machine too much. <laughs> it's genuinely pretty wonderful, if, if a bit intense. Yeah, so that's uh, available to demo at the capstone booth right here at Paxton. Yeah. And that is almost it for the podcast oh, today. Oh, I thought that was... Well, I've just got a quick little update for some people. Um, if I could just have some music, that would be great. Last year, we talked about some stuff, and I had a product oh, which not I, this I put out into the world. <laughs> and I say, what if you had dreamed a dream to change the world? And that dream had led to a lot of difficult financial questions. I'm here today, you can stop the sad music now. You can put the, put the happy music on, put the, put the upbeat like the... Mark, put the happy music on. Mark, you're not gonna get 5% of this if you don't put that... I... Mark, the happy music, not the... We're not, we're not sad, we, we were being pensive and thoughtful, but now we're being... Just forget about it, all right? Just forget it. Mark, listen. <laughs> I've got a great, great update for you. It's uh, the Spatch Tower 1.0 backer update. I know it's been a thing. We were 100% well, 
104% funded on uh, on Packstarter last year. Uh, we got three point, I think three three point four billion in funding. Okay. 3.2, sorry. Uh, we're now 12 months into pre-production of the Spatch Tower, uh, which obviously um, is just a, is some spatulas, uh, which are kind of combined to turn them into a tower. Somebody pointed out to me uh, this week that they've made a functional Spatch Tower, which blew my mind because I hadn't, I hadn't actually no idea what a functional Spatch Tower was. <laughs> and then I realized that it was a dice tower made out of spatulas. And I was like, of course, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, the, we're not sure when it's going to hit retail at the moment. Um, but I just want to you know, have some updates because we've had a lot of questions from people um, about what I've been doing with the money. Uh, where did my $300,000 go <laughs> is a question I've been getting from a lot of you. But you have to bear in mind that like, <laughs> You gotta look at the bigger picture. It's really, we're looking at $3.2 billion. So we're not looking at like $300,000 is a small amount of money. It's just a very, so don't get fixated on that. You know, it doesn't, it's not about that. It's not about you. It's about the bigger picture. Now you can see from this pie chart, the money's gone to a lot of places. Um, a vast amount of the money, if I'm being honest, has been spent on R&D, which is the name of the yacht. Uh, which we've been spending a lot of time on just thinking about some stuff. We had a lot of difficulties with trying to pinpoint down how to mix plastics together to make the, the color right. Uh, we did right. a lot of experimentation with that. It turns out the color, that color already exists. It's just called orange. Uh, so <laughs> we're not, you know, we, we, you know, we appreciate when we've made mistakes. Yeah, um, and what, what if you had, but today only, it's, it's exciting because what if you had one day to change the world again? What would you dream? That's right, it's the Show Mr. Dance Batch to Tour. It's a new paradigm in merchandise, twice. That's right, it's the Spatch Tower, but there's two of them. But, and I've got some great news today. You can get in on this for just $700,000 for 0.4% of the business. Uh, for the Spatch Tour business, obviously all backers of the original Spatch Tower will not get a, two Spatch Towers for this. Is it a problem that the Dice Tower, Spatch Tower? Absolutely not. <laughs> just like last year, this is 100% approved by Tom Vassell of the Dice Tower. This is fine, twice. He actually pulled me up about this in a, a airport after <laughs> PAX last year. He's quite intimidating, he's very tall, but I'm sure he'll be fine with it again. And yeah, the, look, the dreams we dream may grow and change, but the hearts we will have will always be connected with a beautiful future and collaboration and understanding. We can shape the world together. Please stop asking me what I've done with the 3.2 billion. I don't want to talk about it. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much, everybody.